try one more time. Okay, how's that? Well, it works. Perfect. Always okay, great. Slide. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Aaron, for inviting me to be here to share with everyone the flood resilience scorecard and how it can be used to enhance community resilience around flooding. Uh, I'm Natalie Chin, the Climate and Tourism Outreach Specialist with Wisconsin Sea Grants, um, and I'm based at our Lake Superior Field Office, which is located um, with the Lake Superior Reserve in Superior. Um, another of our team members, Maggie Thalen, is also here, um, and Maggie is the Climate and Health Program Manager with the Division of Public Health within the Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Health within the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And Maggie, hopefully I got that right and didn't butcher your title. Um, so I know some folks who are here have already seen some iteration of this presentation before. Um, so thanks for bearing with us as we've been working to roll out the tool and promote it over the last few months. So I'm here today really to briefly introduce the Flood Resilience Scorecard or FRS to all of you, um, its purpose and what we've learned from piloting it, uh, especially for Washburn last year. Um, I'll also share what we're planning in terms of next steps, which will hopefully include uh, some of you. So just a quick overview of kind of the intersections between flooding and public health in Wisconsin and why uh, we really wanted to work to develop this tool. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here that Wisconsin is a landscape that's abundant with water. And according to work done by Wiki, uh, which Madeline was just mentioning, um, annual precipitation in the state has increased by about 15% over the last 70 years. Um, and further increases are projected in the frequency of high intensity rain events through mid-century, which unfortunately, of course, also brings with it a larger risk of flood events in the future. Um, across the state, we've already also been seeing um, reoccurring high intensity flooding, um, including the 2018 flood event in southern Wisconsin, but which was, of course, also felt up here. And with these kind of increased flooding events come also concerns about public health, um, of course, in addition to many other things, um, which is of great interest to the Department of Health Services and uh, Sea Grant. Um, and some of these impacts include both direct and indirect effects, ranging from kind of standing water and infrastructural damage to limited access to medical care, to indoor mold, et cetera. So with the FRS, we're hoping to help communities, particularly municipalities prepare for flooding um, and its direct indir and indirect impacts using kind of a whole community approach. So what is the FRS? Um, the FRS is a guide for local officials, um, really a framework that can be used to have in-depth conversations to assess flood risk, risk and resiliency capacity in their communities with other local staff and experts. Um, overall, the FRS contains three modules, which can be completed together or individually. And these are the environmental, institutional, and social modules, which I'll talk a little bit more about in each um, each in detail in just a second. Um, and then each of these modules is also linked with a set of recommendations. So the FRS is comprised of a set of multiple questions, uh, multiple choice questions, um, some examples of which you can see here. Um, it's really meant to be kind of easy to use and, and score, but also um, it is very comprehensive. So with the completion of each of the subsections of each module, um, the number of kind of A, B, C, or D answers is used to then determine if the given area of focus is one where potential improvements can be made. And then if so, the FRS directs the user again to these kind of cor corresponding set of recommendations, um, a few of which you can uh, see here. So with module one or the environmental module, um, the user is guided through an evaluation of different environmental features of flood vulnerability. Um, and the goal of this module is really to help the user understand how kind of landscape composition in combination with precipitation patterns and land cover features um, determines whether a community will experience recurrent flooding. Uh, module two or the institutional module is more focused on community policies and plans um, as planning and mitigation are less costly and more effective measures of resilience than response and recovery. Um, and this module really helps the user evaluate coordination 
across multiple levels of government and organizations and the strength of the community's um, floodplain policies and regulations. Uh, finally, module three is really focused kind of on more on the people component um, because understanding socioeconomic and cultural so sources of vulnerability are also a crucial step in reducing community flood risk. So in addition, um, kind of understanding flooding effects on health can also help a community develop a more holistic and equitable approach to flood resiliency. So that was a very, very quick overview of the, of the scorecard. And um, I'll, I'll have a link later um, to the website where you can look at everything in more detail. But um, switching gears a little bit to talk about what the scorecard looks like in practice. Um, in February of, of last year, our team hired an intern to do an in-person pilot test of, our, um, of the scorecard, which we were hoping would take place in person last summer. Um, of course, with the pandemic, we had to change plans completely and ended up going through a virtual process. Um, and our goal with this pilot process was really to see how the FRS worked as a tool for a community who's thinking about flooding, but hasn't necessarily um, been devastated by it yet. In addition, we wanted to see how the tool would work for a relatively um, smaller community that may not have as much in terms of capacity and resources, um, because that's a, an area where we think the FRS could really have a, a greater impact. Um, and while the tool had been uh, through some previous testing, we really wanted a more in-depth complete evaluation um, than what had occurred prior. Um, so with the help of our intern, we ended up sele selecting the city of Washburn for our pilot test. And I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you about Washburn, um, but we did choose it because of um, because it's a you know smaller community with more limited municipal flood resources. And again, that's intentional because we think um, you know, this tool is, is meant for, for communities like that. Um, in addition, we know Washburn has been impacted by major storm events, um, again, which, we, which I don't need to tell anyone here about. Um, and then given the uncertainty of the pandemic in the early months, we also made the decision to shift um, from an in-person pilot to having our intern go through the entire scorecard for Washburn without talking to anyone in the community um, to see you know, how long it would take and what uh, the limitations of that approach might be. Um, so long story short, um, our intern, our intern went, th went through the scorecard, a process that took her about 10 hours. Um, and at the end, she was left with some recommendations, which we did present to um, Washburn city official. Um, and I'll talk about more um, what we learned from that process in just a second. But um, as previously mentioned, each of the modules of the scorecard is lin linked with kind of a broad set of recommendations that vary in size and scope. Um, and you can see here for the environmental module, um, some of the recommendations that came out of that process for Washburn were um, things like modeling on-site stormwater storage features um, and enhancing and preserving natural infrastructure with additional water storage capacity. Um, for the institutional module, which looks at, again, um, resources and capacity, we found that many of the flood maps um, that are, or the maps that are used to measure flood um, hazards were limited and outdated. So naturally one of the recommendations that came out of that was to update some of those. And then finally for the social module, which again focuses on people and community health, um, we found that medical services are limited in Washburn and um, may require travel, which you know could be difficult in cases of extreme storms and flooding. Um, and again, you can see some of the recommendations here. Okay, so um, that was a again a very quick overview of our pilot. And sorry, I'm trying to cram a lot in here, but it seems like there's just a lot to talk about. Um, so, what did we learn from this process, and how are we hoping to apply that in terms of next steps? Um, so, as I mentioned before. Um, from our, our kind of conversation with Washburn um, and the process that we went through, we, we learned that community involvement and knowledge is really essential to this process. Um, and so um, that's something that, you know, is going to inform our next steps. In addition, kind of the process of actually doing the scorecard uh, could be tough for a community where staff already have limited time. Um, so some of our next steps include trying to create an online version of the scorecard that's interactive and hopefully like 
could be pre-linked to some of the tools and resources that are used in the process to make it easier and quicker. Um, we also want to continue to test and evaluate it for continuous improvements and efficiency, and then develop some additional kind of support resources that um, can be useful to communities uh, as they go through the process and complete the process and know areas that um, should be prioritized for, for building flood resiliency. Um, so if you're interested in using the scorecard, please feel free to reach out to Maggie or I. Um, we're definitely open to conversations about it, um, offering technical assistance. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, you can find the scorecard online. Um, and if you decide to go through the process without us, you know, we still hope that you will um, reach out and let us know how it goes. Um, and with that, uh, I'll stop again. <laughs> um, hope that was helpful and thanks everyone for your attention.